So an outline for the uh, talk today, uh, we wanted to go over the CTH cloud top height and the convective diagnosis oceanic products that were used in Romeo. Also touch on the Romeo demonstration itself and provide some product details and examples um, from the two products. And I'll wrap up with a uh, summary. That was supposed to be a view from the flight deck. The convective hazard products, um, CTH, CDO. CTH is really um, high clouds, opaque clouds, so they can be registered with the satellite uh, above 15,000 feet, really. Uh, as I mentioned, optically thick. Um, the derived from satellite views um, from the 11 micron channel, as well as the, the model. We use the model data, and I'll talk a little bit about that how we do that. Updates are every 10 minutes, which is really governed by the satellite systems themselves. And for CDO, uh, use my cursor here a little bit. Uh, it's a hazard detector, hazard indicator from zero to six. It uses also satellite information um, from two channels from the geostationary orbits. It's also derived from lightning, uh, the model, as well as uh, satellite, as I mentioned. Values above two are greater than or equal to two are really indicative of a convective hazard. Uh, values greater than three means we have lightning in the area and is also um, a much, uh, or, or overshooting top. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how these are combined together, but it, it's an indicator for the amount of hazard uh, that's present. Uh, it can be updated every five minutes. I think for the demo, we actually did 10 minutes. Um, so it can be updated five minutes because the lightning feed tends to be a little bit more frequent or more frequently available. So why two products? Well, the CTH really defines the larger anvil of the cloud system, um, and the CDO narrows in and characterizes the convection more, um, uh, more closely and, and uh, cues in on the updrafts uh, vertical velocity that could be more um, turbulent. So uh, the cloud top pipe product itself, um, this is uh, estimates of the cloud top from the 11 micron channel. So it's seeing, it's a window channel from the geostationary orbiter. So it's seeing these clouds. It can see it, an opaque cloud and it looks like the temperature of the cloud. So we then reference that with a model and then we can derive a height. And from those heights, we can then do contours at different flight levels, so other um, 32,000 feet, 34, up to 40,000. Other, other contours are possible depending on how the system is configured. And you can see that in the rep representation of this from the IR image, which was the previous slide, the IR image, this is the um, derivation of cloud top from the model. Um, and then we can then contour that to reduce bandwidth and uplink to the, um, the cockpit with these contours, which is much, much less uh, in terms of bandwidth requirements. So similarly, similar, likewise for CDO, um, this defines uh, updraft regions, and we use um, we use six inputs to the CDO product. It's a it's a fuzzy logic combination of six uh, indicators, including the cloud top height. Previously, we also do a global convective diagnosis, which is a water vapor minus IR differencing, and this this can really zero in on vertical velocities when the clouds are very high and opaque. So it's a pretty good indicator in and of itself. We also combine that with overshooting tops algorithm, uh, Chris Bedka's routine from Wangley, and also um, the lightning. And we can either get lightning from the GLM, which is on board goes, not on Himawari, unfortunately, not yet, um, or Earth Networks uh, or NLDN in combination. And you can see the contours here. Um, as they're represented in the uh, diagram. This is just like CTH. And then we provide a contour of these as well. And then you can use the CTH and CDO, you know, and render it however you want. And later on in the presentation today, we'll hear more about how um, GM and BCI is, is doing this. So uh, having a brief overview of the products that were used in Romeo, I'll provide an uh, update or a, uh, an overview of the Romeo Remote Oceanic Meteorological Information Operational Demonstration. So the demonstration was really to evaluate the feasibility for uplink of the information.
transformation of the aircraft. And I think we, we certainly validated that um, uh, idea. Uh, of course, over oceanic reasons, the ground-based radar products are not available. Uh, and in this case, we used Himawari 8 for the Southeast Asia, Australia region, uh, goes east and west uh, for the Americas. Um, it was scheduled from July of 2018 through the end of 2019. That was the operational period. And at NCAR, we've actually been producing the goes east and west products for CTH and CDO on a prototype server and making that available. But that's only slated to run through June of this year, so June 30th. So part of the impetus for this meeting, of course, is what happens after that time. Um, the other uh, uh, goal for the uh, Bromeo was to explore strategies for using um, CTH. And at this time, it was an updated CTH and CDO uh, product in the flight deck um, from the OCCs as well, and also the Airline Operations Center. How were these all used in combination? It was for us supplemental use only. Um, and then the idea was to understand the benefits associated um, with providing the updated information in the flight deck, ATCs and RCs or AOCs. Um, and then we uh, captured feedback from pilots. We'll hear more about that um, later as well. And, um, and, and everybody else who was involved in the uh, analysis. This was kind of my first slide I was going to present. Just kind of highlight what's going to happen during the morning. Um, but obviously the WIDIC program here sponsored the, the program and CAR involves as the PI. Uh, BCI with software applications and display communication support. So Jim is here to give an update on that. Uh, ERAU uh, was of course the uh, next gen test bed uh, involved in, in uh, I believe they were handling some of the SWIM data transfers. Airlines, Delta, American, United were all involved and then Panasonic and GoGo served as the conduit uh, for the data link to the uh, providers. Uh, we'll hear about benefits analysis from Tony at Virginia Tech as well today. And uh, collaborators, of course, as I mentioned, the RTCs, the OCCs, uh, flight standards also involved. I don't think we have anybody from flight standards today. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and the central weather or center weather service units and also NETCA. So that's kind of a broad brush stroke of Romeo, the people involved, the organizations involved. A uh, quick diagram showing some of the data transfer, the architecture involved in the process, satellite data coming in, uh, going across uh, SOAP for HTTPS to the test bed, uh, and then BCI involved here with the data management system to the AOCs and ARCSEs, and then on to the data providers, GoGo and Panasonic for the airlines. A lot of acronyms here, but just kind of shows you that all of the conduits and data flow that were involved in making this happen. Himawari would be on here also. I think this diagram was made before we added Himawari. So any, any questions so far? I see some chats. I don't know if those are comments for me or not. Uh, yeah, uh, this is Lee Hazel Republic. I, I did put it in the chat there. Is there a path to the cockpit other than Wi-Fi? I'm looking out at... Uh, Eldridge. <laughs> so when we did the demonstration, the only thing was available at that time was Wi-Fi. But uh, as you may know, that A-Rink is now working on a capability uh, where there will be in the cockpit a, uh, a data link services. The way we uplink was using the uh, passenger entertainment network up to the airplane. And once it got to the passenger service, we wi fi it up to the, up to the uh, cockpit. Is it? Yeah, that, that answers my question, I guess, from a regional aspect. We we have some challenges with the main lines, Delta American United, that we fly for. Uh, 
taking up that bandwidth on the weather. So we that's why we're looking for alternatives that don't use the Wi-Fi path to either degrade what the customer experience is in the back or to limit the data flow for the cockpit just because of bandwidth. And uh, the way that we're, we move the data using these uh, polygons minimize the data link and it did not in, impact the passenger data. And uh, probably Jim uh, Levo from DCI will talk about the amount of data that flowed through the data link and it was just minimal. I mean, just uh, okay. like in the very, very low megabytes that we updated. So it was no impact. And okay, we great. did whitelist uh, all of the EFBs or the iPads that were used. Therefore, the data could only go through the, to the, that the weather data could only go to the cockpit to the pilots that were on the whitelist. Does that help? Okay, great, thanks. Thanks for the question. So here's, uh, <clears throat> moving right along, here's an example, um, example flight uh, JFK to San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, you can see the grayscale, if I can see my mouse, for sure here, the grayscale here is CTH, and the CDO is the color filled contours. Um, and you can see the CDO color scale here from um, is that medium to extreme um, impact and CTH here in the gray. And then you can see them um, in a larger scale, the CTH polygons once again, and then CDO, and then an overlay of the two showing how they work together. And I think uh, Jim will show more about this later. Uh, here's zeroing in uh, really on the South Central, uh, Central South America. Um, showing a lot of the CDO activity here overlaid on the CTH. Um, I should mention that each airline had its own version of the viewer for pilots and AOC. Uh, and I think this is just the uh, common or the available viewer from uh, BCI. Correct me if I'm wrong there, Jim. It was the same display on the EFB. All the airlines oh, okay. used the same on the EFB. Okay. Oh. Uh, it, was, it was basically a web app that each airline had access to. Okay. Great. Thanks. So um, that's a little uh, overview of CTA or uh, Romeo uh, demo. I'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of the mechanics um, of CTH and CDO itself and how they're derived. Dan Meganhart will go into a little bit of the engineering uh, system um, architecture that's required to, in order to make this happen. So as I mentioned, CTH is derived from 11.2 micron uh, window channel from GOES. Um, it's really amazing how, how this works, but uh, we, we look at the temperature of the cloud top, especially if they're opaque, high clouds, and then we correlate that with the model sounding, and then we can derive a altitude from that cloud top height. Um, and it kind of defo it defines this large area of uh, the anvil, uh, but it may not show individual convective cells necessarily because they all kind of look at, uh, very, very similar at the cloud top. Even cloud top itself is somewhat of a fuzzy concept, but from the satellite point of view, here's another example of reflectivity. This is an example over Florida showing the radar reflectivity, and then we'll overlay that and show the infrared brightness temperature is measured from GOES, and it's a reverse color scale here. So the whites are um, colder temperatures. So these are high cloud um, cold temperatures here involved. We translate that into um, an altitude, and you can see the yellow contours are uh, 30 to 35, and uh, 35 to 40 on up to 50,000 uh, feet here. So you can see how it's uh, converted. Um, for the CTH product. Okay. Anyway, I thought that was really cool. <laughs> for CDO, for CDO, uh, which really narrows in, zeroes in on the convective activity that's going on, we use a GCD product, which is the Global Convective Diagnosis. Uh, it's been around for a few years. Uh, um, 
I think Fred Mosher put this together, looking at the water vapor and infrared differences. And when they're near zero, you're near a thick opti optically thick cloud um, where these two are very similar and in overshooting tops cases as well. So we use a fuzzy logic bandpass filter on these to narrow in on it, combine it with CTH as I described, uh, also include the overshooting tops algorithm as I mentioned. Um, so texture mapping uh, that uh, also from the 11 micron channel. And then, in, 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 then 50% of the CDO product is really lightning. And I'll show an example of why that's important. But we accumulate lightning at 10, 30, and 60 minutes. And that forms 50% of CDO. So you really need that lightning in the product in order to get the full representation of it. So any questions on CDO so far? So here's just an example, uh, graphical depiction of the, of the different inputs, how they're weighted, um, combined to create uh, this, this uh, color-filled contour of convective hazards, data fusion methodology. This is the same case from earlier. Here's the uh, reflectivity uh, from the radar. And then we see the, um, the cloud top as being one signal going in lightning strike accumulation, another, the GCD. And you can see how GCD really pulls in um, the uh, representation of the activity going on. In this case, there are no overshooting tops, excuse me, no overshooting tops. Um, so that it's not mature enough or not enough vertical velocity to, to have that happen or the, any combination of things. But you can see how that plays out. So CDO, uh, you can see the different regions, the numbers, the, the numerical values representing the convective hazards from two to, in this case, two to six is what's being represented. And down here over uh, the lake, um, lightning is important for CDO values greater than two. If you didn't have lightning on there, you wouldn't see this. So that's my my case for, for lightning. So the Hoitic, um Romeo demonstration was successfully conducted, and we'll hear more about that uh, later in the morning. Uh, CTH and CDO products are useful, uh, usable, and they're being used. Um, they're weather, weather as weather, weather hazard guidance products and aviation concerns. My first talk in public since AMS of 2020. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a unique experience. Anyway, so um, the current CTH CDO prototype processing Distribution system from NCAR is going to end at the end of June. So we need to talk about that a little bit as well. And on the right here is um, a representation of CTH uh, showing the Tonga volcano, uh, which was January 15. And it's really quite remarkable. Um, if you watch that from the, the beginning there, how this thing explodes uh, and, and goes up into the uh, stratosphere really. So here it is, this is around four UTC. Uh, 410, 420, I believe. And right there is a signal around 420 and the volcano, you can see this in the 11 micron channel. And you can watch some of the ripples going out in all directions, it's, it's crazy. And this, this is really valuable information. I've been talking to Klaus Sievers about this. He's very excited about this possibility because this was available before or any of the official notifications came around. So there was uh, quite a bit of advanced lead time with the satellite signal, but this is amazing. He also had a, a really nice graphic. I, I didn't have it, but he super um, superimposed this, the image right there, the size of that cloud. And it almost is the size of France. It's huge <laughs> how big this volcano is in terms of impact. Anyway, that's all I have for today. Um, and I'll certainly entertain any questions uh, or discussion. I think we have plenty of time. Eldridge. So the, uh, just the volcano, I'm looking at the volcano and that's just, that should be a higher temperature. So high CTH working at the 11.2 for a higher temperature to get that bloom. It's I think it's it's uh that's a really interesting physics question. I I I guess I hadn't thought of that. I would have thought the water vapor was being injected and it was following the atmosphere um, and being cooled as it uh, was lifted. 
uh, and it cooled off with the atmosphere as it went up. And so that's what the signal was seeing. It's possible, uh, I have that wrong, but <laughs> if anybody else knows about that more than I do, I, I welcome discussion. Randy had a comment. Yeah, you know, I would guess that the as explosive as it was, it wouldn't follow the normal, you know, um, hydrostatic equation. I guess uh, as far as you know the cooling as it as it lifts. So yeah, yeah, I I'm, I don't know if you could trust the the temperatures and things for that. It, just because it's that, that thing got to fifty thousand feet fast. Yeah, it did. Right. So it probably was uh, not environmental and temperature. It's, and and it's. You know, there's a lot of smoke in it and, you know, a lot of definitely a lot of water vapor. But, yeah, it would be interesting to, to huh. get a a sounding from there yeah. just to see what the right, how it was doing. Of course, a sounding wouldn't survive in it, but, <laughs> no, no, but it would still be interesting to see. One. It would. Yeah, that's a really good question, Eldridge. Yeah, that's uh, and I've got a CDO uh, image in the uh, folder as well, um, just showing that CDO lightning was the first occurrence of activity, really. Um, but it, it, it does, you know, show that there's a, you know, maybe another use for this product on the, on the volcanic side. You know, if you can use this up in the Aleutians, for example, probably, oh, right. probably see a lot of activity there. That yeah, much more so. Um, well, yeah, we were talking about the use of CTH in the northern northern latitudes such as Alaska. And I was looking at some of the uh, latitude extents yesterday or last night, and it does look like we could probably do it. And the parallax on something like this would be enormous <laughs> from that angle. Uh, you wouldn't be able to see anything from behind. Well, the good, the good thing on that though is you know, or at least the volcanic center knows where that volcano is, and then you can, you can fix the parallax error based on that. Oh yeah, you right, right. Yeah, we can we can certainly do parallax correction, um, but if there was anything going on behind it, and in this case, you probably wouldn't need to know if there was anything behind it. This is good enough. This is your number one concern at this point. Yeah, that's interesting because GCD also triggered really quickly, which means not only the infrared but the water vapor channels were, were nearly identical, and and obviously the IR was cold. So, yeah, anyway, yeah, great questions. 